My name is Sarah Eberhard, and I am conducting a Veterans History Project interview on August 4, 2004, with Paul R. Grigsby at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. Mr. Grigsby, could I please have you state your name and date of birth? Paul R. Grigsby, 41411. Thank you. Okay, um, to get started here, um, I'd like to ask you a little bit about um, the your background leading up, up to joining the service. Um, were you in school at the time, working, drafted, voluntary? How, how did, how, what, what led up to your, your um, becoming a Well, I was in business in Atlanta, but I knew that I was going to either be drafted or if I couldn't get a commission, I, and I got a commission, so I, uh, I went on in fast. What type of business were, were you in here? Wholesale electronics. Okay. And so you went ahead on in voluntarily, and where, where, where did you, you enlisted here? In Atlanta? Yes. Okay. Well, I was with Eastman Kodak Company before. Okay. Uh, at, at about the time, the same. Uh-huh. Uh, that's right. She's right. I, I, I went in there a little bit. Electronics business after I came back, I guess. Okay. But I was with uh, with East with Eastman Kodak Company and uh, Recordac, which was a, a machine to photograph your uh, records and put them on a small film so you could destroy them originally. See? Okay. And I worked with it with Kodak Company for ten years before I went to service. Okay, and that was here in Atlanta. Yes. Okay, had you also grown up here in the Atlanta area, or uh, did... I traveled all over the southeast. Uh -huh. Florida, Georgia, Alabama. And, and did you have family that lived in Atlanta? Well, that's a long time ago. Mm -hmm. We got married in 62, didn't we? When did we get married? 42. 42, excuse mm -hmm. me. Okay. And uh, uh, my family was, I was born and raised in Florida. Okay. And uh, practically all of my family is in Florida, or mm -hmm. was. Okay. At the time. However, I had some nephews at uh, Savannah uh -huh. and here in Atlanta. Okay. And at the time that you went into the service, did you have any other family members that were also in the, in the service? No. At that time, you were the That's only right. one in your family. And um, were you married at the time that you that you went in? Let's see, because I noticed you enlisted in 1942 also. So yeah, yeah. you got married shortly after. I got married before I went to service. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you were newly married as, uh, when you went into the service, yeah. and um, where was the first place that you reported for your initial training? Dartmouth College. Hanover. Hanover, New Hampshire. Okay. And um, w was this general training or, or uh, what, what was your, your training experience like there? In the well, we were, when I got my commission, they told me that where to go to for my initiation. I, I had to be trained. I'd never been in the service. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you have to, before they'll make give you a commission, you have to have a certain amount of recommendations that you're eligible for it. Right. So, me, my naval officer, yeah. Right, and, and so did you at that time know that um, that you um, would be working with the V-mail and, and records at that point? Yeah, that's right, with the Navy. Okay, and so your, your, your training for that specific type of duty took place um, started taking place from your first. Well, they got me. They, they they wanted me to come in because I knew that kind of thing, and they didn't have anyone that could do it. Okay, and let's see. So you from um, the the training that took place there. How, um, 
But then did you immediately go overseas from that point, or did you have other stops here in the, in the States um, before you shipped out? I don't know. When I went to Dartmouth, you're speaking out? Yeah, after that. I went to Washington. You were in Washington for a while? Okay, how long were you there? Do you remember? Just a short time? Very short time. For three months, okay. And then from there, looking at your um, your service information, it looks like you, did you go to Honolulu from there? Well, I went to Honolulu to get my orders. Okay. As soon as I got my orders, I went to the South Pacific. Okay. I stayed in the South Pacific for three years. Okay. I never did get back to Honolulu. I never did until we got ready to get out of the service. Okay. And why don't you, um, if you'd like to tell a little bit about, you know, when, when you left Honolulu and your, um, your, your trip, trip over to the South Pacific, um, and... They brought me in to handle the mail, victory mail, that went out. It didn't have enough airplanes to take to make it out. So you wrote a letter to San Francisco and they took it out and put it on a roll of film. And I put in 22 different female stations in the Pacific. And uh, once a week, they get a roll of film that have from, from three to 500 or 1,000 names on it or letters in it. And we enlarged them and printed them and delivered them to the servicemen in, in that area. Okay, and so you you really traveled around in several different positions getting these stations set up and then did you take part in, in training some other people on how, how to do this? Well, you... oh yeah, I had to. Absolutely. Different stations. I'd go in and keep getting it going and once I got it going, I'd go to another one. And the Fleet Records Office, we carried about, oh, I don't know, 30 or 40,000 names on little three by five cards of the people who were in the service so that if we got mail, we could look up the name and find out where they were and forward the mail to them. That is it was a job to keep it. Every time a set of orders were changed, we got a copy and changed his name. Uh -huh. If he was transferred to another unit, we put mm -hmm. that on there too. If he died, mm -hmm. we also put that on there. Marines. And the Marines, yeah. yeah. So you were, hand you were handling it for the Navy and the and Marines? And the Marines, yeah. Okay, just those, those two. Yeah, that's right. Those two branches. Now, in regard to as we all know, there was some censorship on on some of the mail that was necessary. Did w did you handle that, or did you work with someone that was handling that? What was that like? I didn't personally handle it. I couldn't. On 22 different locations, once you trained a crew, they handled it for their area. Okay. The, the personnel that, that was in their area, they received mail on a little film. They printed it and delivered it there. And the other film went to another station, they did the same thing. And then when orders were changed, they went to the, the Fleet Records offices and we changed their names so the mail could be forwarded properly. Mm -hmm. And so this was from um, all um, all mail at that that was coming out of that particular location? Or out of San Francisco? Out of San Francisco. Um, not, the, not, not the mail going back, just right. the mail coming out from, from the states. From the San Francisco location. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I see listed some of the locations that um, um, where you worked on here. Um, are there any of the particular stops or locations that you set up that are particularly memorable or challenging no, or, I was, or I, was so, I was so busy moving from one to another. When we got one moving and operating, we went to another location. Honolulu would let us know where they wanted me to go put a station. Mm -hmm. And I'd go to put the station, they'd send the equipment to that location and I'd put the station in and 
train the people, and then once I was sure they could operate it, I went some of it. About how how long did it take at each stop? Oh, it took uh, oh six to ninety days. Okay, so you were you were moving around. I was, I was busy for the four years that I was in in the Pacific. I was very busy. Uh, now, during that time, um, your uh, your wife had relocated to San Francisco. No, she went to Utah. Miss Grigsby, I went to San Francisco with him, and when he left, I had one more year of college. So I graduated from Mills College in a year. But he would write back these hair-raising stories of what he was going through. And he particularly liked Australia and New Zealand. And he said one time he got to a base, in, I think in New Zealand, and they kept asking him if he was cleared for, what do you call it, safety or secrecy. And he said yes, they wouldn't let him in. So he sat in the hotel and ate cherries. And then he finally corrected the situation by telephone. They would, and he got it fixed by telephone with one of the record act machines. In other words, out in that area, you had to give each station the facilities for getting in touch with someone if the station wasn't operating properly. And it was a, a telegraph, it was a telephone, all right, but it was all more, more like a tele, telegraph except mm -hmm. you could talk over it. Uh, but you didn't do much talking, it was all printed, and if it necessary, I'd fly up to their station and get it back in shape. But if it wasn't necessary, I'd give them all the information they needed over the, mm -hmm. over the message center. So in addition to getting the stations set up, you were also troubleshooting the ones that, that, right. that were right. in existence right. Right. As, as well. That's right. Um, about how many people did it take to operate a facility once once you got it up and running? Oh, I would say eighteen to twenty. Wow. And and what about? I'm curious about the the actual piece of equipment itself. How oh, how how Lord. how big was it? How how can uh, can each, we compare it to each anything? Each station we were equipped with two Quonset huts, one for operation and one to live in. And uh, each station had their own little van so the people could go back and forth between where they lived and stayed and where they worked. And it, was, it, was a, it was a pretty complicated operation. And uh, of course they had to go somewhere to eat and they had to go back somewhere to sleep. And then they had to be available for any use that they were called to. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and the, um, the the actual technical process of, of working with this m machine, was it something that was, um, you know, say like the, the size of a, uh, of a, uh, of a room or? I never saw a Quonset hut. Quonset hut was... She's talking about the machinery that I know when she's talking about where we operated, but we had to have we had to have a building that was four times as big as this room. Okay. I'd say six times as big as this room. Okay. For the operation, and if you knew anything about photography, you had to have <coughs> machinery to keep your temperature at a certain level, and your chemicals at a certain level, uh -huh. and you also had to have your electricity to where it was not fluctuating. It was, it was, it was, it was pretty uh, uh -huh. actual like being at home once you got situated. Uh -huh. And you had to have fellows that were <coughs> really interested in, in doing a, 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 an excellent job. Did they have to have, were they required, the, the people that you trained and that were selected to to operate these facilities, did they have to go through any particular screening or have any special requirements themselves? 
No, all they had to have was a desire and the ability. The ability to learn how to enlarge a picture, develop it, print it, put it in envelopes and mail it. Mm -hmm. And then um, once the, um, the the mail was scanned and printed in the envelopes, then did they have to be physic physically addressed to the person? Was there someone else? Oh, yeah, they had to be physically mm -hmm. addressed mm -hmm. to the individual. Mm -hmm. and, uh, oh, they were already addressed. When you got a letter uh, from the <coughs> people in the United States, mm -hmm. in, the, in the top of it was an area that they had to fill in the full name and, and all that they wanted it to go to. They didn't know where he was. They didn't know where he had been transferred or whether he was still living or not. Okay. Each station had a number and they would just address this to the whatever address in Honolulu or <coughs> and from there V mail the, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. The Navy had to find out which station the person was staying in and mail it to that station all over the South Pacific. So it was complicated and no. the they had to have a V-mail, a little tube of pictures of the letter on film, microfilm, that was very small. These had to be put onto a form of a letter in 125 degree heat in the Quonset huts, which was very hard to control. And then the amazing part to me is that these enlisted men, we didn't have computers then, so they had to put every man's address on little three by five cards that was in the South Pacific and keep them separate whether they were in the Navy or the Marines. And, th and those were, um, did they have to make a copy of those cards at each location? No. They kept a record. They kept a record of the man's name and address, but the, uh -huh. they didn't keep them on the cards. They that, just, that was in in uh, just, just in a long form. Okay. Long. All right, and and because these were coming in on the V mail, there these were just they were limited. It was a pretty standard form, so you didn't. You know, there weren't like packages and or enclosures, pictures, or anything they're else coming just, through. They're all just alike. They came through just like that. And the fleet records offices had oh, oh, 80 or 90,000 little three by five cards for people's address and the whole work center. But some people did send fruitcake and pictures. And the only picture that they would allow with the V-mail was a newborn baby if the soldier or sailor or marine had not seen his baby he was allowed to have a picture of that baby on the v-mail okay now what was your um how often were, were you all able um to communicate was was it uh each other mm -hmm, the two of you <laughs> by v-mail that that was it yes. yeah anytime by v-mail but I didn't, I didn't get back. I came in, in four years, three and a half years. I only came ashore three times. Where, where um, did that take place? Huh? Where, where were you able to come ashore? One of these stations, or San Francisco. putting in a new station. Or San Francisco, you came back to San Francisco. Well, if I came back, I came back to San Francisco. Okay. But I only came back three times during three and a half years. Okay. <coughs> when when you were able to um, to get back, how long were you able to stay? Three days to a week at the most. Of course, most of it was travel. But I'd stay about three days once I got there. And I'd have to send a email to Emily and say, well, I'm going to be in San Francisco on a certain date. And she'd come down, we would be together for about three days, and I had to go. Uh -huh. um, now, in, in all of this, because your, your experience is really unique, it's, it's, it, and 
and, and all the traveling around that you did setting up these stations, um, was there anyone in particular that was more harrowing or that was, uh, you know, uh, more difficult to set up or that, that had um, circumstances that really stand out to you on that? Tell about you were on an island when the ship came in with the bomb loaded on the oh, ship. Yeah. Oh, my. I was at, uh, wait a minute. <laughs> Saipan or? No, 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 no. I was, I was, I was in the, I'll think of the name of it in a minute. I was in the harbor that, that brought the bomb that was dropped on. They brought one of our ships, brought the utensil to where our Air Force out there could make the bombs to drop it in Japan, see? The atomic bomb one? Yeah. Okay. And, uh, oh. He, it was a, a, a tremendous ship that came in there, and it was pretty fast. And he felt like that he could, uh, he came out and had to dodge this way or that way and get in there. But he thought he, he could go fast enough to beat them out. And they knew he was there, and so they sank the ship within five, fifteen miles of the port that they delivered the bombs in, and we lost 4,000 lives. Oh my. What, do you remember which ship that was now? I forget. Uh, uh, Indianapolis. Uh, Indianapolis, okay. And that that would have been in, in 45, was it? No, 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 no. no. That was, well, it would have been close to 45 because the bombs were dropped after that. It took a while to prepare the bombs and drop them. And so forth. Forty-four about. The captain of that ship came ashore and he was very secretive. He didn't say why or what he was loaded with. So nobody knew except they just surmised something was going on. Go ahead, I'm trying to remember uh, what the port was that he came into. But go ahead, I'll think about it. That's okay. Um, what about some of the other stops? Any um, particular uh, experiences that, that stand out or, you know, whether they were the people you were working with or the circumstances you had? What, what were some of the differences in setting up a location, say, like in uh, on one of the islands versus in Australia or something like well, that? It's all the same except that if you were in a civilized country, you had a chance to live with civilized people. Not, not that our people were not civilized, but, uh, yeah, Mac MacArthur was uh, in charge of the forces in Australia. And I met MacArthur and knew of him, that's the reason I never did vote for him. <laughs> He was a general that was in charge of the forces in North uh -huh. So our American forces in North Asia. So that's where you were crossing paths with him was when you were in Australia? Yeah. And he objected to Paul's coming into Australia. And Paul had to prove that he had orders there. Yeah. He, and finally MacArthur agreed to let him on. He refused, he refused to let me in and I sent a dispatch back to Pearl Harbor and they sent him a dispatch and told him to cooperate with me in every way possible. So he never did have any use for me. Oh, that's something else. Yeah, I was a, a lieutenant running around telling the general what the heck he could do and what he couldn't do. That's wonderful. And so did you have face to, many face-to-face -face encounters with him? or yeah. running across? No. What was that name? Did you have face-to-face -face encounters with him? Oh yeah, two or three times he'd call me in his office. Uh -huh. If something came up, he'd call me in there. I said, well, I forget what it was, but there was one time there was something that was real crucial. And he told me to knock it off. And I said, well, they sent me down here to do a job, you tell me not to do it. What the hell am I supposed to do? And I went on out. And I went ahead with mine and did it, and then he called me in and was going to have me uh, put 
put under control. Court martial. And that was another check. He, and he got another wire to lay off of me and give me my give me all the help that he could get. Right. And and so. So that was interesting. I was out there all that time, and but I got full cooperation from mm -hmm. Pearl Harbor. And <clears throat> anything that I got in any trouble or any excuse or anything I needed, I just send them a wire, and it was delivered to me. Uh -huh. So there, there were. It sounded like a lot of unique challenges. Whether it was how how civilized it was, or even the people that that were above you that you were. You're, you were dealing with. Um, and my orders also included one thing. My orders, I mean my travel, I, I traveled on one set of orders for three years. I didn't get different orders. I had mm -hmm. the same set of orders. And in that set of orders I got six dollars a day in money uh, for, for my food. Mm -hmm. And if I had to and spend any money for transportation or for extra food or for anything. All I had to do was write, write a note on it and that was put in the next check. Mm -hmm. To me, one of the sad things is that now nobody has ever heard of female. They don't even know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And it is victory mail and it was used all during World War II in the South Pacific. And if we hadn't had that, they wouldn't have had any mail. Exactly. Yeah. Why don't you? The, the, I, I'd like to hear from the perspective of someone that was on the other side that was sending the mail, and you knew people that were sending mail. The um, what the procedure and 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 the impact of it here. What? How? Where would you go to get your V mail forms? Was there any cost involved? And, and what? How often? You know, just from from your perspective, what? How was it used? They wrote into San Francisco, and San Francisco took <coughs> took their letter <coughs> and reduced it to, to the size it could be sent through. <coughs> and on your end, when when you would need, I had to write it on the form. I guess that was distributed by the post office. I've forgotten. Yeah. But I had to write the letter on the form. Then it would be sent to. San Francisco and reduced to the microfilm size, which was make it about a minute thing, then sent over seas and wherever Paul was, they would transform that into a letter and that letter would be sent to the sailors. And was there any charge at all for for doing the the V mails? Um on your on your end, your postage uh, to yeah. San Francisco. Right. Okay. And, and then, was there any particular limit, or you could send as many? I mean, as many as you wanted, or you could send as many as you wanted, but you got it mostly on a space. About. Well, if you're doing all that drinking, you can get me that other one. I'll drink part of it. <laughs> yeah. okay. You want a part of it, too? No. The amazing part was I, when I got out of college, I got a job with the, they had APR numbers, postal office numbers of the islands, and I got a job with the Navy, a secret job, so I could tell where Paul was by the number because I had the listing of the islands. So I, of course, never let anybody know where he was. And so your job was not involved with the mail. You were working as a civilian Navy employee? Yes, I was in a civilian working for the Navy, in the APR offices and where the mail came in. In other words, the mail from the United States came into mm -hmm. this place and she was working in there. Then it was sent by a number to the island, whatever island was 
where the to sailor or marine was. So the, the sorting took place there in San Francisco. Yes. It all came to San Francisco, was sorted there, and like you said, then by number, you knew where um, so it should... To the South Pacific, or um, Australia. Was there much censoring on any of the of this mail from coming in from the states at all? And what if there was? What type of things were they looking for? Do you know? I don't know. I really don't know. I don't think there's much censoring. Uh, I don't think they had any problem there. We don't know. The censors mm -hmm. did that. He was not connected with the censors, and I was not either in the where I worked. So uh, you could not send food and a lot of food was sent to San Francisco mm -hmm. and it just had to rot or be thrown away. Because they couldn't send it on out mm -hmm. with the little microfilm. Um, what was that? And I know it probably varied depending on location as well, but about how long would it take from the time that, uh, say, something was sent from Atlanta then we get to San Francisco, then how long would it take to get to the location? Next morning. Sometimes. Oh. Next morning. As quick as the next morning. Yeah, wow. I got in there, and they put it on a film, and that film went out on the next airplane and left her. Wow. And think of the space it saved. Oh, yeah. Because the mail would have just bogged down. Mm -hmm. And yeah. what the film was in the in the machine, how long did that process take to actually then print it out on that side? The machine was a record deck. You, you talk about that. It was not very big. The record deck was well, not that big. It was, <laughs> it was about as big as that, but not that high. It, long hair. Well, and, and teller and feet about half. The record deck was... A machine yeah. that took the pictures of the letters and put them on the microfilm, mm -hmm. and then that was sent to the Pacific. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, but the record act was used. I really to, don't remember on that part of it because I didn't get in that much. Record act was used in banks to microfilm checks and endorsements of the checks, mm -hmm. and that's how it started here in the United States. Then he was the first female officer in Washington, D.C., and he was relieved when he requested service overseas. He was relieved by Irene Rich's daughter, a movie star, but then he was sent to San Francisco and went by ship to Honolulu, and I stayed in San Francisco. And the one time that he got back for a few days was the time I was taking my comprehensive exams at Mills College, exam for four years of school, plus I had about 17 balls under my arm and platter warts on my feet from standing um, and dancing with Mills College dances, and then I was suffering so much, Paul got a soldering iron and put wet towels under my arm with the soldering iron there, and it felt wonderful. Oh my God. But it relieved the pain. Uh -huh. But I was singing in the San Francisco Opera Company at the same time, so I had to stand on my feet. So and it was quite an experience. It, is that where you were ma majoring in, in music specifically there? No, or? I, no. I majored in psychology. But anyway, uh -huh. I had to take my exams there, and it was a horrendous experience. And then after one day, I took the exams, I sang in the opera company that night. I met Paul afterwards, and we went over to the Claremont Hotel, where the officers' club was. And by then, I said to Paul, don't come back until you can stay. <laughs> and that was his very first trip. Yes. Back over. Right. Oh my goodness. I've been out so long, there wasn't any chance of me having to go back. Uh -huh. I've been out over three years, nearly four years, three and a half years. Uh -huh. When he was out of the Navy, he was out, in other words. That yeah. was after three and a half years. So once um, 
that was something else I, I wanted to talk about. Once you um, complete, completed your service, and what, what was the last, your last stop before you came back permanently? The, the last, last station. Class. The last station. Were you in, New, in uh, New Zealand? Was that your last stop before you were sent back? I don't know New Zealand so far. I don't know what it was, really. When, when they declared armistice, where were you? I was back in the States because they knew what the score was, and I had been advised not to establish any more stations that this was coming and so forth. So I was back, and as soon as the, as soon as the thing was signed, I flew into San Francisco. Okay, and then how long did did it take before you were um, then completely completely out of the service? Then they sent him from San Francisco to Norfolk because he was having asthma, so they kept him in the hospital there. And then when I could finish my contract singing, I met him again in Atlanta. And we've been here. See, since. I came back in July or August, August or September, and I was allergic to all of that stuff that was going on in that time of the year. Mm -hmm. And so uh, as soon as I came ashore, I began to, my old asthma picked up and they sent me over there to the hospital. And uh, as, soon as, as soon as the season of all that pollen was over, they gave me pills to take and let me mm -hmm. go on back home. And then you were discharged then yeah. after you after you were out of the hospital. So that was like late forty five or yeah. or so. And right. and at that time um, you'd already decided to come back to Atlanta because that's where you were. Yeah. Part yeah. Of. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And in fact, I called Eastman Kodak Company and told them I was back from the service. I was ready to take my old job in Atlanta. I was in charge of everything in Atlanta, providing they paid me more money. And they said, ha, 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 you're going to Cincinnati. I said, Cincinnati, you're behind. I'm as far north as I'm ever going. And I hung up, and that's the last I ever heard of Kodak Company. Uh, where, where were they located? What part of Atlanta were they in? Well, I forget where Peace we were. Street. Someone on Peachtree. Okay. I don't know where it was, but Kodak Company major thing was up up east, and I uh, we we had offices on, somewhere on Peace Street Road, up Peace Street Street. I don't know where it was. Okay, and and were you where where did the two of you meet? Were you from Atlanta or no? I was from Kentucky, but I was going to Vanderbilt, and we met uh -huh. there. But during the war, I stayed at Mills College and then worked in San Francisco. And we gave blood, we wound bandages, we watched the paper, we babysat with war widows. We, we, it was a sort of a nail-biting time because people were coming back. Where, what was that? Yeah, what, what was... Um, I mean, I, I just can't imagine what, what it was like being in school and what everything that was going on at the same time. What, what were some of the things that stand out to you in terms of what you were balancing? and Rationing of gas and tires. And I was going to Mills College, and I would drive over the Bay Bridge to the San Francisco Opera Company. And going, on, going back and forth across the Bay Bridge, we would pick up the sailors from Treasure Island just fill up the cars. Everybody stopped for sailors. And I never had one problem with these young men. They were very protective of me. And you know, when you got over there, you could fill up with gasoline without, without any... Well, that's when I went to Treasure Island to use my coupons. And once in a while, these sailors would not take my coupons because they knew that I picked them up. But it was a, an amazing uh, Back experience. in the days when they were allocating gasoline, you know, you had, mm -hmm. to, had, to, had to show, you had to do it in business. And she wasn't in business. 
and meat was rationed, butter was rationed. Yeah. I lived on eggs. Mm -hmm. I must have had high cholesterol because eggs were easy to get. Now, yeah. where... Um, you want where, fresh for this? Fresh, oh yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Um, or, um, now, were you living on in your own apartment or on, on campus, or what I were your living arrangement? I lived on campus for one year. Then I got an apartment in the Mission District, which was the Italian district. And San in San Francisco, the bottom floor is not the main floor. The second floor is the main floor. And so my landlords were Sicilian, and they lived on the first floor. And they couldn't read or write, so it was my job to read for them. And they would write, invite me down to these sumptuous meals, Italian food and Sicilian food. Right. So I was very fortunate. And then I had an, a Kentucky friend who came out to stay with me in this house. And then after that, I had an apartment with a friend. So I moved two or three times. And I lived one time with Waves. Waves mm -hmm. were the women, maybe, enlistees and officers. And we had some experiences with the Waves. And mm -hmm. Paul would send back men, officers that he knew, to, and say, take my wife out dinner dancing, and uh -huh. they would, and then I went to a ship's christening one night with a man from Kentucky, and this, he was a sailor, and this officer tripped him personally, just, he tried to trip him, and this sailor fell and pulled me down, and we slid under the captain's table. <laughs> And the captain acted as if nothing had happened. Mm -hmm. So I was helped to my feet, and I mm -hmm. got up and put my hands on my hips, and I said mm -hmm. to that officer, you caused this. It's your fault. Mm -hmm. Of course, he just mm -hmm. walked off. So we had some experiences. Fun, but mm -hmm. the war was not a good experience. Yeah. A long time. A lonesome time. And Paul would send me back occasionally. Orchid lays have them shipped by plane back. And I never did want to brag to my Mills College mm -hmm. people about having them, so I just mm -hmm. kept them in my room. So there, there were nice things going on. And people were very friendly during the war. They picked up everybody. And one time we were driving from Washington out to San Francisco, and Paul had a Plymouth whose tires were rotten, and one of them, two of them blew. So we had to stop and wait for hours because the tires were rationed. But we finally, he got them because he was in the Navy and on mm -hmm. orders. So we drove on to San Francisco. So it was an interesting experience. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so like you said, after you came back, you, you didn't uh, go back to your old job, but you did stay here in Atlanta. Yes. And what, what was the transition like after? I mean, there were a lot of people, of course, making the transition, but, but, but what was it like going, uh, you know, going from that experience, transitioning back into your uh career and to your day-to-day -day routine. Back into Atlanta where I'd never lived before, but people were very smug. I had thought I would come back and sing with an opera company. There was no opera company, no symphony. People said to me, I have all the friends I want. I don't care to meet new people. <laughs> and we were living with Paul's family, so it was not a happy experience. Where was this here in, in town? In in in, in, yes. in Buckhead. In Buckhead. Mm -hmm. But anyway, now it's fine, and I'm 
you eventually yes. settled out, and um, where, where did uh, where did things kind of start taking a, a, a turn for you? Was there anything you got involved in, or a particular thing that that started making it more comfortable here in Atlanta for you? Well, Paul had his own friends, and he played golf and bridge, and he was down determined that I was going to sit down and play bridge, and you couldn't stop if you were winning. And you couldn't stop if you were losing. She so, didn't play bridge or ten run, man. I did, and I enjoyed it. But so anyway, we've, as Paul says, we've lived separate lives together mm -hmm. for a long time. Yeah. And um, one other thing that uh, that we like to ask is, are you ever in in touch with, or do you um, get together with anyone you knew from that time, people either you served with, or like in your case, the the people you worked with on the home front? Granger Wow. Granger Wow, yeah. Granger Wow, when, when I went up to Dartmouth to get my commission, I made a friend up there from Michigan, Granger Wow, and uh, that's enough, don't you think? I, I do want to get this like this one. That's enough. Let's just think, we'll finish up this little bit here and then we can wrap it up. Granger Wild was my age and, and he was kind of, when we were drilling, he was clumsy. I mean, he somehow I was right behind him and I always stepped on his slippers and his shoes came off and he out there changed his, and that's why we became friends, but we're friends to this day. He's still living. Most of them are passed on. Uh-huh. And yeah. is but he? That was the only, only, only one. Uh-huh. So and do you he still? And his, he and his wife and we and their children have been yeah. long-time friends, uh -huh. visited each other. They were in Port Huron, Michigan. And then in Arizona, yeah. Tucson. So we can't say enough about he invited, he, he invited me, he called me one day after we came back. He called me one day and said, he, I asked him, I said, well, what are you doing these days besides playing golf? He said, well, I'm going up to Canada on a hunting trip. I said, well, that's great. He didn't invite me. And he said, well, uh, 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 he said, I wish I could. I said, I wish you could, too. I was just talking. So about a week later, he called me and said, you're invited. And I was amazed. I said, tell me about it. He said, well, I'll tell you about it, hell. I was already told, told when you were coming. So I'll pick you up at the airport in Detroit on a certain day. And I said, well, gee, I don't know what I was getting into, this rich bunch going up into Canada. In western Ontario, there's a great big area. It's wild. And there's a hunting group that, that uh, you, we went for two weeks. And every kind of hunting in the world was, uh, oh, we were in a thousand acres, and we were the only ones there hunting, see? And uh, I'll never forget, it. Went, I think I went 12 or 13 years with him. I needed me, he'd pick me up in Detroit, and we'd catch a train on up there, and that, that was great. They would live on a houseboat, and they had Indian cook on the boat, a woman cook, and then the Indian guides. And the thing that interested me was, the Indian guides used to tell them, now save us the bacon grease, because we spread it on bread and that gives us en energy. And then one day, they said, you all want to bring back the loin of the roast of all these animals, and the moose liver is the finest thing in the world. So Paul brought back a moose liver, frozen, and it was all I could do to lift it, and I finally borrowed, pounds. I borrowed a pan and cooked it, and then got down on the kitchen floor and sieved it, and we had enough pate to plaster the whole inside of the house. <laughs> but it was delicious. Mm -hmm. It was good, but it was too much of it. Mm -hmm. Well, 
Do you have any anything else that you've thought of you'd like to add, or I mean, no. yeah, something you? No, thank you. You're about about ready to wrap it up. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, and this concludes the interview with uh, Paul and Emily Grigsby at the Atlanta History Center on August fourth, two thousand four.